You got it. We are very grateful for our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, God is at work and moving still to this day, and that's what we're going to be highlighting tonight at our Sunday night gathering. Uh, Todd and Jamie Voschel will be sharing with us tonight uh, how God has been working in their lives, especially through what Todd went through recently. And so um, we are super excited for that. Hopefully you can join us 6 p.m. tonight. Um, Matthew 27, if you have your Bibles, Matthew 27. We're getting to the end. Are you guys excited to finish Matthew? Amen. Yes. And move on. This has been, it's been so amazing to work through a gospel. Uh, Working through gospels are a little different than working through uh, some some of Paul's epistles, some of the Old Testament. Uh, And so it's been very, very beneficial, hopefully for you, as it has been for me. Now, Uh, Many people throughout history have stood before authority figures because of their devotion and love for Jesus. In fact, in Scripture, we see Peter and John stand before the council in Acts chapter 4, and they charge them, and they say, hey, you can't speak in the name of Jesus. And they say, actually, uh, we can, and we will, because that's the only thing we can do is speak in his name. Paul then, later in Acts 24, stands before Felix, uh, the governor, and does exactly the same. And from there, throughout history, many have stood before authority figures, many who have given their lives for Jesus in the sake of the gospel. There are uh, some very enriching stories of martyrs, people who stood up to authority figures because of Jesus. Not only that, many people throughout history have stood before crowds just like this, and they have... in. They've stood before crowds in the name of Jesus, being witnesses of his resurrection and the new life that is possible through him. And they stand before crowds because they know that the resurrection turns everything upside down. Peter stood before the crowd in Acts chapter 2 after he had received the Spirit and he preached the gospel. He preached the resurrection and 3,000 people were added that day. Later on, Paul stood before the crowd in Acts chapter 13 And he, knowing who they were, preached the gospel to them. And from there, many have stood before crowds and proclaimed Jesus in his resurrection. Sometimes being received gladly and other times being completely rejected. There's one pastor who, because of his faithfulness to the gospel, was locked out of his own church. And so he preached outside the church. All right? You can't stop it. Not only that, many people throughout history have stood before one another, individuals, to lovingly explain who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what that means for us. In Scripture, we see Philip standing before the eunuch or sitting next to the eunuch in Acts chapter 8, explaining who Jesus is. We also see Priscilla and Aquila standing before Apollos, who's very qualified and and very talented and gifted, and yet didn't quite grasp the gospel in full. And so they took him aside and they shared the gospel with them. And so from there, people all over the world have been standing before one another, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And hopefully you're doing the same thing in your life, sharing the good news of Jesus with other people on an individual basis. Now I share this just to ask the question, why? Why would people do these things? Why are people willing to stand before authorities in the name of Jesus? Why are people willing to stand before the crowds in the name of Jesus? And why are people willing to stand before one another in the name of Jesus? Well, the answer is very simple. It's because that's what Jesus has did, did for us on the way to the cross. In in Matthew 27, we're going to see that he stood before the governor, and then he stood before the crowd, and then he stood before the criminal. And you want to know why he was willing to do this? So that he could stand before the Father on our behalf. In this section, Matthew 27, 11 through 26 Here's what we're going to see today. Before Jesus would stand before the Father on our behalf, he stood before the governor, the crowd, and the criminal for you and for me. 
And so today I want us to soak in Jesus' willingness to be our advocate, our supporter, our defender, and our deliverer. And so let's jump in. And first, let's look at when Jesus stood before the governor. We're going to look at verses 11, Matthew 27, 11 through 14. And if you weren't with us last week, we talked about some pretty dark passages with the trial and then Judas hanging himself. And so we're at the point where Jesus is being handed over to the governor. Now, verse 11, now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. This has been a long night for Jesus, hasn't it? He's been betrayed. He's been arrested. He's been falsely accused. He's been condemned by the Sanhedrin. He's been spat on, struck, slapped, mocked. And he has been denied by his closest friends. And now he has been delivered to Pilate, the governor, whom he is standing right before. And so the question we have to ask is, who is Pilate? Many of us know Pilate's name because of the story of Jesus' death and resurrection, correct? But we really have to think about, who is Pilate? He seems to come out of nowhere. There's no mention of Pilate before this chapter in Matthew's Gospel. And so he comes out of nowhere. But Pilate, from 26 to 37 AD, he was Rome's prefect in Judea. Or in other words, he was like the captain of the area, if you will. Tiberius Caesar assigned Pilate to this region, which was not an easy task. And this wasn't an easy task for two reasons. First, because it was remote. And so a lot of people didn't want to go there in the first place. Second, because there were some rebellious people living there the Jewish people. There were a lot of rebellious Jewish people who did not like Rome and their authority. And so there was a lot of hostile crowds. There was a lot of different people there. There was a lot of Jewish nationalists who did not like Rome. And so he was put in place to be the governor, the authority in that region. And one thing we have to know is that he has Caesar's authority. So as people interact with Pontius Pilate, it's as if they're interacting with Caesar himself because Caesar placed him there. And so that's who Pilate is. He is literally Caesar's authority in Judea. This Pilate then asks two questions of Jesus. First, are you the king of the Jews? With this question, we can rightly assume what the charge was against Jesus from the Sanhedrin. Not only was Jesus going to apparently desecrate a holy place, that's what we talked about last week, right? He was going to tear down the temple and build it back up in three days. But here we see that Jesus apparently is sowing discord throughout Judea, forbidding people to pay tribute to Caesar and claiming to be the anointed king of the Jews. These were offenses against Roman law and they were false accusations against Jesus. Jesus. And that's why Pilate comes to Jesus and he says, are you the king of the Jews like the Sanhedrin is saying you are? How does Jesus respond? He says those words, you have said so. We heard this last week when he was with Caiaphas, right? You have said so. I love that answer from Jesus. Uh, This answer is brilliant because he is saying yes without saying yes. Have you said this to someone before? Where someone asks you a question and you're like, you said it, right? In that moment, you are saying yes, you're right, without actually saying yes in the moment. And so he says, you have said so. And so he is ambiguously acknowledging that in fact he is the king of the Jews, but not king like an earthly king that the Jewish people expected, right? And so The Jewish people wanted an earthly king or were expecting the Messiah, the Christ, to be an earthly king to to literally rid them of Rome's authority so that the Jewish people could once again be their own nation and govern themselves. 
And here comes Christ, the Messiah, and he's not here to establish an earthly kingdom, but rather an eternal kingdom. And so in a sense, he's like, you've said so. Yes, I am the king of the Jews, but not like you think I am. You have said so. When Pilate asks this question, he unknowingly is speaking the truth in this moment. Jesus is the king of the Jews. He's the king of the world. Second, the second question, he says, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? To this question, Jesus continues to fulfill God's will and God's word. And how does he do that? By giving no answer, right? By giving no answer, he was fulfilling God's will and God's word in the same moment. He remained silent because, like we saw last week, he is the suffering servant from Isaiah 53, 7, who does not open his mouth like a lamb being led to the slaughter, correct? And so he's fulfilling this passage. And guess what? This is exactly who Jesus is. He is the Lamb of God, isn't he? He's the Lamb of God. In John 1, 36, look at what John the Baptist says. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And then look what we see in Revelation 5, 11 through 12. In John's revelation, he says, Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering the myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. From this passage, Jesus remains silent only to be slain, and he is slain so that he can reign. Jesus fulfills God's will and God's word with remaining silent to Pilate's second question. And so he responds to silence. Now, after Jesus' silence, we see Pilate's response. And I love that phrase. And he was greatly amazed. Throughout the gospel, you see people marvel at Jesus. You see people wonder at Jesus. You see people literally astonished because of Jesus, right? When he feeds 5,000, when he walks on water, when he does all these miraculous healings, people are just absolutely amazed at who Jesus is. And here we see Pilate doing the exact same thing. As Jesus is being falsely accused, as Jesus gives no answer, no defense, we see Pilate is marveling at Christ. Why is he doing this? Well, it's simple. It's because Jesus offered no defense. Now, have you ever been accused of a crime before? Any hands? No? Okay. You don't have to admit that today. I have never been accused of any crime, but I've seen enough crime shows to know what's the first thing that you do when you're accused of a crime. Yeah, you lawyer up. Absolutely, right? So don't be talking. Plead the fifth. Don't say anything. Lawyer up, all right? Get a defense lawyer and a good one at that. Whether you're guilty or innocent, you need a lawyer. And specifically, you don't get a divorce divorce lawyer. You don't get a a, a different lawyer who's going to help with an accident. What do you get? You get a defense lawyer, right? Because you want to defend yourself in the moment for what you're being accused of in your life. Jesus here does not give a defense, does he? He does not lawyer up. Pilate is amazed because anyone else who stood before the governor would surely defend themselves. The amount of times Pilate has been in the judgment seat, which we're going to talk about in a second, And he's sat here and he's talked to someone who's being accused of a crime, maybe going to prison, maybe being put to death. And he says, give an account for yourself, defend yourself. I guarantee you 100% of the time, guess what they did? They defended themselves. And here we see Jesus absolutely being falsely accused, and he knows he is. And Jesus gives no defense. He gives no defense. Just like he could have prevented his arrest, he could have prevented his sentence of death if he simply defended himself. But instead of defending himself, Jesus defends us, doesn't he? He defends us in this moment. Jesus stood before the governor so that he could be our defender. Look at this. 
my God, my God, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior, you save me from violence. Because of Jesus, we can echo these words, can't we? And then look at this. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. We can echo these words because of Jesus, can't we? And then look at Psalm 121. This is the entire psalm. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Did you see the word, the very redundant word in the psalm? What is it? Keep, right? He keeps us. He defends us. He is our help. He's the one that comes. Jesus is now our defender. We can echo these words. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. I love those words in Psalm 121. Jesus defends us with his silence before the governor so that he can be our boisterous defender before the Father. So that we might stand with confidence and without fear in the presence of God having Jesus as our advocate and our high priest. And none of this is based on what we've done. It's all based on what Jesus has done for us. We should be greatly amazed at Jesus today. We should be greatly amazed at Jesus' response as he stood before the governor and he did not defend himself. He kept silent then so that he could be our spokesman before the Father now. And I pray that you would grasp onto that truth in your life, that you have a spokesman, a mediator, an intercessor before the Father. But before he got to the Father's right hand, he stood before the governor. Now let's look at what he did next. Jesus stood before the crowd. Let's read verses 15 through 23 in Matthew 27. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called the Christ? And they said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. Jesus' trial is progressing here, and they apparently move to a more public place before the crowd. And we are told that they gathered where Pilate asked the crowd a few questions. But first, we have to really think about where did they gather? We're told in verse 19 that Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat. And look at what John 19, 13 says. It says, so when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic, Gabbatha, which it's ironic that Pilate's on the judgment seat judging Jesus when, of course, that's going to be flipped, right? When Jesus is going to be judging Pilate after his resurrection. Now we have to ask, what is Gabbatha? So I I just want you to picture this real quick. And so before, Jesus was kind of inside, and and he's talking with Pilate. People are defending him. But then they bring him out to the crowd, a very public place. And then Pilate gets up on this judgment seat, which it would be on a stone pavement. That's a flat pavement. And then there would be steps up, and there would be a seat, much like the judges today, correct? Uh, You go into a courtroom, which, by the way, I've never really been in one, okay? But from the crime shows, uh, the, the judges sit higher than everybody else, all right? And yes, 
That's the standard I look to for crime, is the crime shows, okay? Um, but it's the same thing. It's uh, this high platform with a C on it. And that's what Pilate would sit on as he was giving out sentences or judging the criminals before him, okay? Now, uh, Jesus is sitting there before Pilate with a, a, a crown of thorns on him after being spit on, mocked, uh, uh, hit, he has a purple robe on him, and he's sitting before the crowd, maybe even potentially facing the crowd, maybe facing Pilate, who knows. But he's before the crowd, he's before Pilate. Now, if you're having a hard time picture this, they think they've found uh, Pilate's judgment seat here, okay? And so, um, if you can't read the red, because it's kind of small, I thought I made it bigger, but apparently I didn't. But over there on the left, or on the, that side, okay? If you see those little two, two little steps there, that's, that, that's apparently the door to Pilate's palace, which of course has been uh, blocked off. But you see the two steps there that would lead up there. And then on the left side of the tree, there's a stone pavement there. There's a lower sto- stone pavement and there's an upper stone pavement, stone pavement. And it's on that ledge that they would have a platform and a seat on it for Pilate to sit at. And so I just want you to take this in for a minute and just kind of bring it into your mind, this, this vivid imagery of, of Jesus before Pilate, a massive crowd right here, and Pilate sitting on this seat. The crowd is absolutely up in arms against Jesus, and they have this notorious sinner, Barabbas, notorious criminal, and they have Jesus, who is innocent and righteous, which we've read And this crowd is yelling out, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus. You see, a lot of times in our lives, especially if you've been following Christ, you read these passages and you're like, oh yeah, I've read this before. Yeah, this happens to Jesus. But do you actually think about what's actually happened to Jesus? He stood before the crowd. He stood before a judgment seat. The innocent one was being judged. He stands before the crowd. He stands before Pilate. Pilate is sitting on his judgment seat, and Pilate's wife sends him a note. Verse 19, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. In this sad, dark passages leading to the cross, there are two true statements of Jesus that stand out. We read one last week when Judas goes into the temple, and he says, Uh, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. That's a very true statement of Judas, isn't it? He has sinned, and it was against innocent blood, right? And here we see the second statement, have nothing to do with that righteous man. Pilate's wife knew who Jesus was because of a dream she had, and this is very important because every dream in the Gospel of Matthew came from God. And so any dream that's mentioned in this gospel came from God. And so we can rightly assume that this dream she had wasn't just some flippant dream. It was a dream from God. And so she sends word to her husband and she says, don't have anything to do with this righteous man. She not only thinks that Jesus is innocent, but that he is righteous. She is unknowingly bringing to mind Isaiah 53, 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. When Jesus is before the crowd, we see that he is the righteous one here mentioned in Isaiah 53. He is about to bear the iniquities of the unrighteous so that they can be accounted righteous. Here we see the great exchange about to come into play she says have nothing to do with this righteous one but of course like most husbands he brushes it off right he brushes it off because of the crowd if it was just him and his wife and Jesus maybe it would have been a different outcome but because the crowd is there because the crowd was up in arms because of the crowd he continues the crowd knew that Pilate released a prisoner at every Passover. 
this here, remember, I told you, this is a rebellious area, okay? A lot of Jewish nationalists. And so to get on their good side, apparently Pilate has put into place uh, this thing he does at every Passover where he releases one of their prisoners to get in their good gracious. Like, oh yeah, we like Pilate. He gives us a prisoner every year. And so the prisoner, and mind you, it's not a prisoner Barabbas wanted to let go. Did you see in verse 15, right at the beginning, It's a prisoner whom they wanted, the crowd wanted. So the crowd was in control of who's being released here, all right? And Pilate had the authority to release them, and so they were working together. Pilate gave them the choice, who do you want, Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Christ? Now, why does Pilate say Jesus who is called the Christ? Well, speculation says that there's some early New Testament manuscripts that give Barabbas That's his last name, but they give him the first name of Jesus, okay? And then over time, that's kind of been taken out. We don't really know if that was his first name or if Barabbas was his first name. It doesn't really matter, but it would make sense that that Pilate would say, do you want Jesus Barabbas or do you want Jesus who's called the Christ, right? He's making that differentiation between Jesus's, if you will. That's speculation. But no matter the case, Barabbas or Jesus, who do you want to be released? The crowd had a choice. It was their choice. Barabbas, who was a notorious prisoner. He was an insurrectionist, we learn in other Gospels. He was a murderer. Barabbas' cross was already waiting for him. He already received a death sentence, most likely at this point. And for insurrectionists, anybody who was against Rome, the lowest of the low criminals, it was crucifixion, right? Right? And so he had a cross waiting for him already. It was waiting for him to carry. It was waiting for him to go and be in the middle of most likely his two friends, other insurrectionists, one on his right and one on his left. And in the middle was supposed to be Barabbas, the leader, the notorious criminal, the one people know about. They could have chosen Barabbas or they could choose Jesus, who is the Christ, who came to save people from their sins, who came to redeem them and set captives free who had gut-wrenching compassion on the crowds time and time and time and time again. They chose Barabbas and in turn lobbied for Jesus' crucifixion. They chose Barabbas instead of Christ, possibly thinking that between the two, Barabbas would give them freedom from Rome now. But they disregarded the fact that Jesus could free them for eternity. This isn't the first time God's people chose someone else over their true king, is it? In the Old Testament, we see God's people choose King Saul as their savior instead of God himself. And here they're doing the exact same thing. Jesus stood before the crowd as they picked a different savior. Barabbas will save us. He's an insurrectionist. He's going to revolt. He's going to rebel. We let him go. He's going to build up an army and take Rome out. They chose Barabbas, and in so doing, Pilate also asked them, what should I do with the Christ? What should I do with Jesus? They had the option to either exile him or to put him in prison for a long time, but instead they chose the lowest of the low. They they chose a criminal's death, crucifixion. As they picked a different Savior, Jesus looked at them and showed them compassion. He showed them compassion, the same compassion he showed them when they were hungry, when he fed the 5,000, when when they were sick, he healed them. When they were lame, he allowed them to walk. When they were blind, he allowed them to see. When they were lost, he found them. Jesus set his gaze on the crowd, and instead of standing up for himself, lobbying for his own release, his gut-wrenching compassion flowed from his heart to those who condemned him in the moment. The righteous one shows compassion on the unrighteous by bearing their iniquities so that they may be accounted righteous before the Father. And how do we know that Jesus had compassion on them? Because look what he prays on the cross. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's compassion for the crowd. That's compassion for those who condemned him. That's compassion for those who put him on the cross, all the way to his last breath, Jesus' compassion for lost souls shines forth. He showed compassion on them, 
now so that he could compassionately intercede for us before the Father. You see, through compassion, Jesus intercedes for sinners like you and me. He did that right then and there. And then now he is before his Father doing the same exact thing. He is before his Father interceding, mediating your advocate right now. But before he got there, he stood before the crowd. And last, Jesus stands before the criminal. He stands before the criminal. Let's read verses 24 through 26. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing with the crowd. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew that he was handed over because of envy and envy only. He knew that they were only doing this because they did not like Jesus and what he had to offer them. But like C.S. Lewis said, he, he was merciful, Pilate was merciful, until it became risky. In other words, Pilate was willing to let this happen because he was only thinking about himself in this moment. He was only thinking about himself so much so that he went on to make a public declaration of his innocence, which ironically shows that he's even more guilty of this, right? He washes his hands before the crowd. But really, we know that he's heaping up more guilt on him. Pilate washes his hands, but the crowd dirties theirs. They take responsibility for the blood of Christ. And in this moment, they invoke a curse on themselves and on their children. His blood be on us. His blood be on us. will be the guilty party, they said. The sad reality is that this curse would soon come to pass. 33 years later, as an insurrection against Rome failed and led to the destruction of their temple and their city walls, in AD 70, there was a massacre of the Jewish people and their children. They chose the wrong savior. It makes me think 33 years later was Barabbas their leader of that insurrection. We don't know. He could have been, maybe not. They chose the wrong savior. But here's the beauty of Jesus. Is that they invoked a curse on themselves, but Jesus becomes a curse for us. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Jesus became a curse for us, but only after Barabbas is released. Jesus went and hung on the cross after they released Barabbas. I imagine them both standing before the crowd, both standing before the judgment seat of Pilate, both uh, shackled up in chains. And I imagine them just standing there listening to the crowd, standing there listening to release Barabbas, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus, crucify Jesus. And then finally Pilate's like, fine, have Barabbas. And they take the chains off of him. And I wonder, I wonder if he looked back at Jesus and just smiled. I wonder if he looked back at Jesus and smiled and walked away and probably thought, how did I get out of this one? They release Barabbas, and in so doing, Jesus then could become a curse for us. Pilate let Barabbas free because in the moment, that was best for him. The crowd took the blame for Jesus' blood because in the moment, that was best for them. But Jesus stood before the criminal, watched him walk away free because in the moment and for eternity, that was best for us. Jesus let the criminal free then so that we could have freedom before the Father now. As he stands before the Father, we have the freedom to enter into the holies of holy through Christ, to approach the throne of grace with confidence because we have been set free from sin and death through the righteous one. We have been set free. So why was Jesus willing to do this? Just to kind of wrap this all up today. 
because soon he would be highly exalted to go before the Father on behalf of all those who affirm, agree, and identify with him. He was willing to stand before the governor, stand before the crowd, stand before the criminal because he knew that he was going to be highly exalted and seated at the right hand of the Father where he was going to intercede, mediate, and advocate for those who affirm him, agree with him, and identify with him in our lives. He goes before the Father for us because we need a defender. We need a spokesman. We need an intercessor. We need an advocate. We need a savior. We need Jesus to acknowledge us before his father. And he knew that. That's why he was willing to be silent before Pilate. That's why he was willing to take the the judgment before the judgment seat. That's why he was willing to watch Barabbas walk away free. Because he knew of his victory, he knew of his exaltation, he knew what you and I needed in the moment. And so how should we respond to this? This is great and all for us to think about, right? But how do we respond to this in our everyday lives? Well, Jesus already told us in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men... I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We respond to Jesus by acknowledging him, affirming him, agreeing with him, and identifying him with him in our lives before others. For all of us, this looks a little different, right? We all have different contexts. And so for some of you... uh, literally acknowledge him and affirming him, agreeing with him, maybe mean evangelizing and going to your family or your friends and, and you share Jesus Christ. Or, or maybe you're newer to Christianity and you're like, just simply walking in through the church doors is me acknowledging that I need him in my life. Great. We're so glad you do that. So no matter whether you're from the beginning of your Christian walk or you're way further down, all of us need to think about, are we acknowledging him in our lives? As those opportunities arise, are we affirming him in our lives? Are we agreeing with who he is and what he's told us and how he's told us to live? And are we identifying with him, unashamed of the gospel, like Paul in Romans 1.16? When we publicly identify with Jesus in our lives, he promises to publicly identify with us before his Father in heaven. This is what the cross leads to. Is the fact that we have a savior, a mediator, an advocate who is willing to identify with lowly sinners like you and me so that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we can walk into the holies of holies where we could never have before. And we could only do that through Jesus Christ. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And we can't go where? To the Father, except through him. We need Jesus to be our advocate. We need Jesus to be our mediator, our savior. Jesus is willing to acknowledge you before the Father. The question is, is are you willing to acknowledge him as your savior? And I pray that that's a question you think about every single day. Because every single day is another opportunity to acknowledge the Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son Jesus and that it's only through him that we can go before you. He is the righteous one who takes on all of our iniquity so that we may be righteous, so that we can approach you with confidence, so that we can walk into your throne room, so that we can go into the holies of holies, go into your presence God, before Jesus was highly exalted to your right hand, he was willing to stand before authorities. He was willing to stand before crowds. And he was willing to stand before others. Lord, I pray that we would be willing to do the same today. That we would be willing to stand before people in your name 
acknowledging you in our lives because you are so worth it. You are the only one worthy to be praised. We pray this in your name. Amen. There's no better way than to acknowledge Jesus than to uh, partake in communion, correct? And that's what we get to do today. So if you're helping to serve communion, come on up.